Shall we rise up to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for granting us journeys to be here. And thank you for all the people who are listening everywhere. We pray, Lord, all of us will learn together in Jesus' name. And we pray that we'll not just be hearers of the word alone, readers of the word alone, we'll be doers of the word in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, by your spirit to make personal application to our lives and to obey every jot and every detail, every detail of what to teach us every time in Jesus' name. Bless our children in the children's section. Our youths who are also here with us, studying the word with us, bless them in your word in Jesus' name. And for us, brothers and sisters, I pray that the grace to obey your word you grant unto us. Help us, Lord, not to transfer the word to other people, but to make personal application and personal decision to follow through all our lives in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding that we will see and behold great and wonderful things you have for each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you to our Bible study tonight as we come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. If you have been with us, studying the Bible regularly with us on Mondays, you'll know that we have already gone through chapter 8 of the Acts of the Apostles. But we had what we'll call a panoramic view. That means we just swept through everything. It's like when you're in a plane and then you look at the ground, you see the whole city almost. But then when you come down, you want to look at some details because when you have that kind of view up there, you're not able to see the details. That's why we're coming back now to Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 and I'm reading from verse 1. As you look at this chapter, the chapter is special and specific because it's like a transitional chapter. It's a gateway to the rest of the Acts of the Apostles and also to the next phase of Christ's plan for the church. That's the reason we cannot just uh, sweep through and read through without coming back to the details. As you look at, at the beginning of the chapter, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. That's referring you back to chapter 7. Because we learned about the death of Stephen. As you look at that word death, when you look at the word death, different people see death in different ways. When sinners look at death, or when they hear about death, they panic before, because for them, that's the end of all things. And then, because they do not know where they're going to spend eternity. But when people like uh, Stephen, like Peter, like Paul, when they, when they hear about death, they know it's the gateway to glory. It doesn't bring any panic to them. It brings an anticipation, expectation that something great is waiting for them on the other side. That's what Stephen realized because he saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand side of God. And he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And when God looks at death, God looks at death in a different way to you from men. And when the Lord Jesus Christ thinks about death or looks at death, he looks at that in a different perspective. He looks at death as the homecoming of his own children. And then the final separation, eternal separation of the people who do not believe in him. Come back to chapter 8 verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. You would have thought then that it means that Saul actually maybe was the one that planned everything. But you need to understand for a child of God that all things work with them for good. For them that love God and to those who are called by his name. The Lord has appointed a time for us here on earth. And one, not one moment or one minute will be cut away from any one of our lives in Jesus' name. And so it wasn't the people in Acts chapter 7. All those people, they didn't cut short the life of Stephen at all. Because it had appointed, it had been appointed unto men. How they will live and how long they will live. And the Lord actually fulfilled his will in the life of Stephen. But before he died, he finished everything the Lord had appointed for 
for him to do. I pray that before you go, you'll finish everything the Lord has appointed for you in Jesus' name. And then it says, and at that time, at what time? At the time of the death of Stephen. At that time, at what time? At the time that immediately followed the death of Stephen. It says, and at that time, at the time of real persecution, real pain, and real suffering in the early church at that time, it says, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and there and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles again I want you to understand that when they were persecuted they were scattered into all the regions of Judea and Samaria I want you to look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 we're looking at verse 8 here. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 8. It tells us in verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. You see those two words, Jerusalem, then it says Judea and Samaria. Actually, the Lord Jesus Christ had commanded his own disciples. He had told them, wait until you have the Holy Ghost upon you. And when you have that Holy Ghost upon you, you'll become witnesses unto me. What does that mean? You witness to my name. You witness to my salvation. You witness to my sacrifice. You witness to what I have done for the salvation of the world. You say, yes, we saw him die. Yes, we heard that he died. And then we saw him that he rose from the dead. You will witness to the fact that my death, my resurrection brings salvation, eternal life to all the people that will believe on me. Where would you do that? Number one, you'll do that in Jerusalem. Number two, you'll do that in Judea. Number three, you'll do it in Samaria. Number four, on to the uttermost part of the earth. But the disciples miss something. They lost a word here and it's the word you'll be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. They substituted the word first for the word both. Instead of doing everything at the same time, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the earth, they stayed in Jerusalem. And because of that, God allowed persecution. And when the persecution came, come back to Acts chapter 8 verse 1. It says, and Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Then it says, except the apostles. What were the apostles remaining in Jerusalem so that they will continue the preaching of the word in Jerusalem and then all these believers that scattered abroad, they will be able to preach the gospel in Judea, Samaria and then to the uttermost part of the earth. Let's look at verse 2 and it says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. They made a great lamentation because they saw it was a great loss to the church. It was a great loss to Jerusalem. It was a great loss to the people of the world at that time. A man like Stephen, that had the power of God, the Spirit of God, the gifts of the Spirit. A man like Stephen, full of faith and full of power. A man like Stephen, that worked miracle signs and wonders among the people. What a great loss they sustained. That's why they made great lamentation over him. What a great loss we had. A man that could heal the sick. A man that could work miracles. A man that will be telling us about the Lord Jesus can so the light of the gospel and show us the way to heaven. We lost such a man. That's why they made great lamentation over him. When he was alive, he didn't know that such people were there that loved him, that appreciated him, that knew the value of his life. After he was gone was when they made the great lamentation. And it says, this was were devout men. They were men that believed in the Lord. They were men that were zealous for the, they were men that were passionate for righteousness and passionate and zealous for the things of the Lord. That's why they were not ashamed and that's why they were not timid or fearful to carry his body. They didn't think what if the people who killed the saving, if they saw us making lamentation, will they not run at us? These devout men, zealous men, and these dedicated men, and these uh, people that were consecrated to the Lord. They didn't care about what the unbelievers will do. They had 
public identification with Stephen, and then he was buried. We're told in verse 3, as for Saul, he made the havoc of the church, entering into every house and healing men and women, committed them to prison. You notice that before this time, the persecution was against the apostles. If you remember in chapter 4, they laid hands on those apostles and they put them in hold. If you notice chapter 5, they laid hands on those apostles and they imprisoned them. And when they imprisoned them, the angel came and said, come out and go and declare all the words of this life. The persecution had been centered on those apostles. Look at uh, chapter 5 and we're reading there from verse 14. It says, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles, apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. We're told and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and delay in the temple and every house they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ but not the persecution has shifted it shifted from the apostles now to the membership of the church and that's the reason why they were taken away from their homes and their houses but we were told what happened after that look at chapter 8 and verse 4 therefore because they were scattered therefore because they were taken away and driven away from their homes and all their properties. Therefore, because there were no more in Jerusalem, everywhere they went now, it says they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. What were they doing? They were preaching the word. They were preaching the word. That teaches us an important lesson that the work of the Lord is not only for the apostles. It's not only for the evangelists and the pastors. It's for everyone. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. There are some people that, you know, they, they come to church. They say they are born again. They say they are saved. And they say they are children of God. But they think it's only the apostles that preach. They think it's only the evangelists and the pastors that preach. They think it's only the people who are, you know, leaders in the church that preach. They do not understand that there is the ministry for everyone. First Corinthians chapter 15. In First Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 57 and 58. Open your Bible to First Corinthians chapter 15. We're looking at verse 57. But thanks be to God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because he gives us victory, it doesn't only really give victory to the apostles. It doesn't only really give victory to the evangelists. It doesn't only really give victory to the pastors and leaders of the church. It gives victory to everyone. Victory over sin. Victory over sickness and victory over evil spirits. He grants us the victory because of his death for us and because he rose up for justification. He says, therefore, in verse 58, my beloved brethren, you see this address of brethren now, be ye steadfast or movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Brethren, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Believers, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Members of the church, Beloved children of God, brethren, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Do you see then that as we look at what the early church did, all the members were involved. In fact, that's why we're looking at this message. Every believer reaching every creature for Christ. It's yours. It's your responsibility. It's your duty. You will do it. And as you do it, the Lord will give you victory in Jesus' name. Uh, can I just show you that it's not only these people we read about in a chapter in a chapter eight. Come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter eleven, and I'm reading from verse nineteen. Acts chapter 11, we're looking at verse 19. Now, they that were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia. You see that? Not only those who read about in uh, chapter 8, in chapter 11 here, they kept on traveling. They kept on tra chapter 9, they kept on traveling. Chapter 10, they kept on traveling. And then chapter 11, it goes, it went on and on. And it says all those people that were scattered abroad about the persecution that arose upon Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch 
preaching the word. That's it. Preaching the word. Preaching the word. Everywhere they went, they were preaching the word. What, what a, an example for us. A model for us. A pattern for us. That everywhere we go to, we're preaching the word. Look at verse 20. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Their preaching brought converts and brought people unto the Lord. From this chapter, chapter 8 that we're studying today, the church took a giant step towards fulfilling Christ's plan of preaching the gospel to every creature. And this is what the study should do for us, that as we study and we see the pattern, we see the example, we see the model, we see the zeal of other believers in their own, at their own time, that this will spur us and stir us up, that we too we will do what they have done, and the Lord will be with us as we do it, and many souls will come to the Lord in Jesus' name. In James chapter 1, James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 22, there are people that only read the Bible, they never obey, they had hear the Bible, they never obey, and they will say, well, I was there, I learned all that. It's not just to listen, it's not just to learn, it is to make a personal application, and so make a decision that by the grace of God, I'm going to be a doer of the word. We're looking at James chapter 1 verse 22. It says, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Be you doers of the word and not listeners only. Be you doers of the word and not learners only. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man, any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a mirror in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. He learns about evangelism. He doesn't look at his life, examine his life. Am I a soul winner? Am I doing Christian work? Am I doing something for the Lord? In my community am I preaching the gospel? In the boss am I preaching the gospel? When I come across people, do I open my mouth? Do I tell them the word of the Lord? Am I sowing the seed that will give me eternal rewards? Am I preparing for heaven? I'm preparing other people for heaven. They never check up. We just read the word of God and then we go away. But it says in verse 24, for he beholded himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth the Therein. He be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. A doer of the work. That's a work to do. As for every believer, it's not just apostles and pastors and preachers and, and evangelists and teachers and, and, uh, and prophets. It says every believer, a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. This man shall be blessed. I pray that the blessing of obedience will be upon your life in Jesus' name. What if we're here and we don't observe? What if we're here and we don't do it? What if we're here and we don't apply ourselves to the obedience of the word? Look at first Peter.